Hello and welcome to the third podcast episode of Clean Energy Dialogues. My name is Thiago Bajau. I'm the executive president of EPE, the Brazilian agency responsible for energy statistics and planning studies to support the Ministry of Mines and Energy. EPE is co-hosting these podcasts in partnership with the 21st Century Power Partnership, an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial that has been around since 2012. EPE and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, are strong partners in helping to run the power partnership. We're excited to record this podcast as a contribution to the upcoming 12th Clean Energy Ministerial Meeting being hosted by the Government of Chile. Our topic today is hydrogen in the context of net zero energy systems. And today we have three superb guests to help us understand this topic from different perspectives. Our first guest today is Barbara Jinks. She has over 35 years of experience in the gas industry from greenfield projects to international corporate roles. Barbara has academic training in engineering, environmental protection and law and has experience across most parts of the gas industry. She's currently at the intergovernmental organization IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, where she looks after the topic of greening the gas sector, focusing on biomethane and hydrogen. Barbara is based in Bonn, Germany. Our second guest is Cedric Philibeth. Cedric is an energy and climate change analyst with focus on renewables for industry and transport, electrification and hydrogen. He has an amazing experience having worked at the IEA, the International Energy Agency, for almost 20 years. Cedric is based in Paris. And our third guest is Rachel Crouch. She's a project finance senior associate at Northern Rose Fulbright. She represents developers, commercial banks, multilateral and bilateral development finance institutions, private equity funds and institutional investors in debt financing and equity transactions for energy and infrastructure projects, including solar, wind, LNG, desalinization and mining projects in the United States and emerging markets, including Latin America. Rachel is based in Washington, D.C., Well, thank you for accepting our invitation. And to kick off our conversation, I have a first question for you, Barbara. Hydrogen use has a long history in the petrochemical industry and transport sectors, but it's a relatively minor contributor to the energy uh, picture globally. What has changed recently to explain the new buzz around hydrogen and how this fuel or energy carrier can accelerate the energy transition in your perspective? Thank you, Tiago, and thank you um, for the invitation to speak at this event. I think that you, so. your question is in two parts. The first part is uh, what is the role um, of hydrogen? IRENA has uh, issued recently, last month, an outlook to 2050, and hydrogen plays a significant role. Hydrogen plays a role of about 12% of end-use energy And, and that really is where there's no alternative. Energy efficiency measures, electrification measures, and there's no, there's no alternative. So you, we need um, an alternative fuel as feedstock and combustion fuel. Electrification can only, sorry, only 51% of end use can be electrified. So we're really looking at the 49% and, that, and hydrogen really fits for the 49% that can't be electrified. So I think it's a, It's a realization that we need to speed up decarbonization. We didn't have that realization 15 years ago. And we have lots more information and knowledge and awareness about these hard to decarbonize sectors, which is heavy industry, heavy um, transport, aviation, shipping. Um, up, up to now, we didn't really need to look for an alternative. We had natural gas. It was cheap. It was seen as clean. It was very abundant. And all our processes were established the supply chains, the production, the end use, the facilities. But now there's a realization that natural gas does not fit. We cannot reach the 1.5 scenario, staying with natural gas as the cleanest fuel. And renewables is, is has to fit that role. And that's why also hydrogen is being looked at to really replace other fuels, in particular the natural gas. And of course, hydrogen could be made Uh, cost competitive with other renewable energies and green hydrogen could be made cost competitive with blue hydrogen. So suddenly that opens up a whole new market. And of, of, of course, there, we, 
on the planet, we have abundant renewable energy. If we can capture that and through electrolysis make green hydrogen and transport it or use it where it's needed, then that's again, that's a new formula for global trade. So, and, and we see, my final point is we see also the end users are realizing this. And there's a lot of R&D going into being able to use hydrogen in glass making, green steel, looking for new methods with it. We don't need coal and fossil fuels and transportation has been big developments in innovation so i think that answers your question that um we didn't think we needed it before but now we do and now we're seeing all these opportunities and it it's not a hype i think it's a huge potential and it is a buzz so um that's and, and Irina, of course we're doing our best to promote it as much as we can thanks well thank you barbara it's very interesting to hear from you about the growing confidence in in the role of hydrogen as an enabler of decarbonization across sectors particularly where end users cannot be electrified now cedric i'd like to hear from you now given the many applications that hydrogen has and thinking in terms of a development and deployment roadmap what are the uses that countries and businesses could explore in the shorter term? Or in other words, where do they start first and grow into with maturity? Well, I wonder if the hydrogen today has a lot of applications. It has a few. It has refining and it has making chemicals, basically ammonia and methanol, and a few other niches in electronics, glass making and others. And to me, of course, uh, the first thing should be to decarbonize hydrogen in its current uses, because it makes little sense to create from nowhere new uses if we still use hydrogen as a dirty gas, where a uh, production of one kilogram of hydrogen entails the uh, emissions of 10 kilogram of uh, CO2 if it's made from natural gas and 20 if it's made from, from coal, as in, in China mostly. And then... The next big use is again not as a fuel, but as an industrial gas, and it will be to decarbonize steel making. Steel making is a big challenge. Today, 7% of the global emissions. Tomorrow, as we decarbonize the power sector, it will be 15% or more of the uh, residual emissions by 2035 or 2040. And we need to decarbonize this. And hydrogen is the only almost mature technology to doing that. Uh, we can think of electro winning in the future using electrons directly to uh, reduce the iron ores that the big role that hydrogen can play is to reduce the, uh, the iron ores, uh, turn the ores into metallic iron, and then it can be uh, melt in electric arc furnaces and uh, so transformed into steel. And, and that's certainly the big thing, and it will take some time to move from the so-called oxygen routes with the uh, basic oxygen furnace uh, and the blast furnaces to a, a different route, which is called the electric road, route, uh, which uh, ha already exists, uh, which is made from natural gas to uh, reduce the iron ores. But in this, hydrogen can fully substitute to, to, to the uh, thin gas extracted from the uh, natural gas and then to the electric arc furnaces that could be moved by uh, green electrons as well. And so we could almost fully decarbonize uh, the steel making. And certainly this is a, the major, the major thing to do. Uh, I must say, I'm much more skeptical on many other potential uses. Uh, in transport, I see some niches. Basically, the two big niches, there are more than niches, are aviation and maritime, because you cannot electrify them. Uh, you can electrify the, the short sea ships, the short sea ferries, but then you have to have a fuel. And my take on this is that it will be green ammonia made from green hydrogen that will be used in the existing diesel engine of the big ships, the uh, container ships, the uh, bulk carriers, etc. Um, in aviation, probably we will manufacture synthetic kerosene with carbon from the biomass and green hydrogen. Brazil, for example, could be a good country for doing that because of its biomass uh, opportunities and uh, it's uh, green electricity. But we have to be very careful when we talk about green electricity because what matters if you, if you add electrolyzers on the grid, it's not so much the uh, average content of the average kilowatt hour. It's a marginal carbon content of the marginal kilowatt hour. If you run electrolyzers, but because of that, you have to factor in more gas turbines, not to mention coal, 
you will have more emissions than the gray hydrogen we are using today. And, and so there is probably a window for the blue hydrogen made from gas with carbon capture and storage before we have decarbonized all the rest um, with electricity and decarbonize the electric sector first. So we were sure to have green electricity to make our hydrogen. Now, Rachel, I also have a first question for you. Considering your background from a business perspective, what do you see as the main challenges companies are facing today when considering investments in the hydrogen production and use? And which strategies are companies using to get into this market? Um, I would say I see two main challenges here. First, uh, cost and, and pricing. And second, finding a suitable offtake structure. So first, when it comes to price, uh, developers of hydrogen projects are naturally going to need to look at the price of, of what they're producing in comparison to the alternatives. So, of course, the, the natural first comparison is um, of green hydrogen versus blue hydrogen versus the traditional gray hydrogen made with, with fossil fuels and with no carbon capture. And, and to some extent, government incentives uh, like tax credits in the U.S. And, and other support mechanisms in other countries can can fill some of those gaps, uh, as well as obviously a price or a tax on carbon can help to fill this gap. Um, perhaps the, the trickier exercise, going a little bit to, to some of uh, Cedric's points earlier, um, is to look at, at the alternatives um, when we compare Price in the new markets that we're thinking about for for green fuels, so mobility, whether it's for heavy heavy road transport or or shipping or aviation, um, power generation, heating, industrial applications, and so on. Um, and in each of these cases, compare the price of, of the hydrogen to other low carbon alternatives. I think you know in each of these cases, a business needs to take a hard look at whether the hydrogen that they can produce uh, it comes in at a low enough cost to make it the preferable alternative to uh, to things like batteries or, or carbon capture or direct electric electrification. I think. Uh, Once you once you look once you once you figure out uh, that that fundamentally your business can compete against against these alternatives, in other words, that you figured out this this cost and, and price element. I think the second challenge is to figure out your revenue stream, what your revenue stream looks like. And and unless you want to and, and are able to finance your project on your balance sheet, uh, you're going to need to find debt and equity for your project. And for the most part. Uh, financiers are going to need to see a contracted revenue stream before they'll look at the project. I'm, I'm coming at this as a project finance lawyer, and, and we spend a lot of time talking with our clients about what does a bankable contract look like. Um, in basic terms, especially in new industries, lenders in particular are not going to provide debt financing unless you have a long-term offtake contract uh, with a, with a creditworthy offtaker. And then um, I, I talked a little bit about, about some of the main challenges, and you asked me as a second part of your question about the strategies that companies are using to get into the market. Um, for the most part, we're still seeing companies that are still seeing projects that are financed uh, and implemented on balance sheet, and some of the, the larger players in particular. Um, we are starting to see clients uh, asking for our advice and putting together bankable contract structures, but it, it really is still early days in those markets. Um, it seems like the, mark, the, the projects that are, that are being deployed the quickest are often partnerships of some sort between a hydrogen producer and the hydrogen user, where you don't necessarily have to deal with some of the trickier questions uh, around offtake structures that I was just talking about. Thanks for your insights, uh, Rachel. Just a brief comment or reaction. Uh, we have seen a lot of attention on how to reduce costs on the production side of the hydrogen market equation. But we also have many challenges on the demand side and use of hydrogen. That means uh, transforming sectors and processes to create demand, right? Industry and transport will uh, need to make it make the investments uh, in a way to create new demand for hydrogen. And that, of course, will require a lot of financing so that we can uh, really have the scale, not only on the production side, but also on the demand side, right? Correct. Yeah, and I think that's one reason why why this this uh, these questions about hydrogen are, are so interesting, but also in some ways more difficult uh, than thinking through the business case for renewables, where, where there was clearly 
clearly a, a, a demand already existing on, on, in terms of in terms of the electricity use from the grid. Now, coming back to you, Barbara, which countries, in your perspective, are leading the deployment of hydrogen use? And if you can mention some good examples of deployment, that would be very interesting to hear from you. And a second part of this question, if you can comment about countries that are in process of planning to take action in hydrogen and have a strong likelihood of success due to their uh, natural endowments, for example. Yeah, and if I may, I just wanted to react to uh, what Rachel was saying, that apart from to, to help with the bankability of a project, um, we see it as essential that certification system, you know, with guarantees of origin where you can track what is the energy you're buying, where does it come from, how green is it, what defines green, and we've, we see that that's a very important factor for any project to get approvals, and I imagine also in the banking industry. Um, to answer your question, there are many countries that are, well, there's a few countries that are leading the deployment of hydrogen use. And of course, um, there isn't any uh, global trade at the moment. It's too early for that, but there's a lot of interest in that. Last year, in 2020, the number of countries that hydrogen, have hydrogen strategies tripled from five to 20. And um, that is the first stage of a country really making a commitment to uh, deploying or, or encouraging a, a, an industry, a national industry in hydrogen. So that's a, a very good indicator and a sign. And there's more, lots more in the pipeline, so to speak. Certainly within IRE, Arena's membership, we are, we um, over half of our membership, and we have 163 members. Over half of our members have signed up for a platform that we have to to facilitate public-private dialogue, and it's called the Collaborative Framework on Green Hydrogen. And we have about 17 members, so that's another clear signal of how many countries are. Uh, interested but the leaders i would have to say are really in a, a few areas in in the eu is leading of course the eu has one of the biggest demands has one of the biggest problems to solve with its emissions but within the eu denmark is very proactive um con with looking to convert wind to hydrogen in um holland as well um looking at offshore both of these are really looking at offshore wind holland has actually been testing the reuse of a gas pipeline and has been operating a pipeline since 2018 with 100% hydrogen with no problems. And also we see a lot of activity with Spain and Portugal where the cheapest solar and wind is, mostly solar down there, and of course, and in Europe. And of course, they're looking at using the existing gas code plus new build uh, network to deliver that hydrogen all over Europe. In the Middle East and North Africa, We're seeing a lot of activity from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Oman, Morocco, looking to develop hydrogen nationally, but definitely to export. And all eyes are on Europe for export. If you look at a map, like all roads lead to, lead to Rome or Europe. And, if, and further afield, Australia is very active in developing solar and wind to green hydrogen and green ammonia. And Chile and Brazil are looking at developing projects and, the, and the, all of the, the governments in all of these countries I've mentioned are very supportive and active and we see that in our negotiations. I would have to say that in terms of spending money and doing things on the ground, Germany has to be the world leader. It, it actually has the largest ambitions in Europe for a hydrogen economy because of course, it, again, it needs it. It really needs it. It has a lot of um, hard to decarbonize sectors. It has a very high population And it has a very high uh, amount of industry with large consumption of fossil fuels at the moment. Um, it has put on the table 12 billion euros. And that is all, all this available is all this information is available in the German hydrogen strategy online. And it is planning on having 20 gigawatts of electrolysis by 2030 and up to 70 by 2050. And it admits that it can only it expects to only produce 15 percent of that itself. And it will look for import. So it's really leading this discussion and having lots of discussions with other countries. And I think that triggered a lot of activity within Germany. At the moment, there are over 60 power to gas plants putting up to 10 percent of hydrogen into the pipeline, pipeline grid as we speak. And if you want details on that, the, the DVGW, which is the Gas Industry Association, heads up all that research. And that's the highest in Europe, 10% in the pipelines. Um, so those are the, I think those are the leaders and those are the countries that we see a lot of activity from. Um, and to answer your third question, we really see a lot of activity and, in, and commitment and enthusiasm in emerging countries. And that really is um, China and sub-Saharan Africa. So much potential and a lot of, uh, a lot of 
planning and projection and feasibility studies. And we're really monitoring that and we're in close um, contact with, with our members there. So we see a lot of activity there as well. But I think the bottom line is anywhere you have an abundant wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, wave wind, and it's an excess, then it, it's an area where you can develop and hydrogen for, for exports or certainly for your own hard to decarbonize sectors after the priority areas of renewable electricity and renewable electri- electrification using renewable electricity as Cedric was saying we we we're really looking at um we always promote the priorities for such a valuable commodity like green hydrogen thank you Well, thank you. And uh, actually, we see that these initiatives and policies will end up helping shape the regulatory framework and the market, both on a domestic level, but also on a global level. And of course, leading countries will more likely help shape the hydrogen market, right? The the geopolitics is just fascinating. Countries that were energy poor or economy poor are sometimes in the middle of some of the most abundant renewable energy sources in solar and wind. And the opportunities for them are huge. And the geopolitics is completely changing. If you think of how the coal, the oil, the gas industry, even the nuclear industry with the um, the, the, the materials from the ground, the, the excavation and the, and the global trade, look how they developed. And now we're looking at a completely new trade in in possibly new trade in energy so the the opportunity is huge and and Irina looks at the geopolitics as well with interest and the opportunities to raise economies to create jobs social equity it's it's very it's an exciting space but but, but with big challenges of course but nothing is without challenges and, and I must say on a technical commercial level everything is doable it's just down to us as social beings and communities and governments to really um, agree on what is a priority over the next 30 years and and let's get cracking on looking at the priorities and doing the right thing. Okay. Um, Now, Cedric, hydrogen has been mentioned as an option to clean up hard to decarbonize sectors of the economy. But as you mentioned before, we also need to be clear about the barriers. And I'd like to ask you for more examples of potential applications for hydrogen to effectively help decarbonize. Of course, there are technological issues, but I mean market challenges. For example, how can we encourage industries such as cement or steel to reduce their emissions when they operate on you know, thin profit margins and any who introduce more costly practices may be priced out of the market? I think there are basically five hard to decarbonize sectors. Three we already mentioned, steel, steel making, aviation, shipping. The others are cement. And basically the big problem with cement, there are two problems with cement. One is energy. The other is process emissions. And hydrogen is not the solution for the process emissions of cement. And the last sector is the power sector itself when uh, it's run mostly on viable renewables such as solar and wind. We have to uh, ensure electricity security with um, some backup during the uh, what is called the dark doldrums, the, the famous week or two weeks without uh, with low solar and low winds. And for this, we'll probably need for long um, some power plants in which we can put natural gas in the first place. But then ultimately, we will put hydrogen if we can store hydrogen uh, near the plants or relatively near the plants. Uh, So it depends if we have saline deposits or not. And if we don't, we probably turn to ammonia because it's much easier to store ammonia in big steel tanks uh, cost effectively. That's, for example, what Japan wants to do, importing uh, ammonia from Middle East and Australia and uh, storing it locally and burning it uh, even as mid-merit or even base load plants uh, because it believes that the cost of renewables will be too high uh, in Japan, which may or may not be true, depends on the de- development of uh, offshore uh, floating wind power. Uh, but there will certainly be a, be one big client for green hydrogen as green ammonia in the coming years. I, I don't believe the other sectors are really hard to decarbonize, and I For example, I I wouldn't take for granted that only 51% of the uh, final energy demand can be electrified. I would say, no, that's 
probably goes to 90% or 95%. Um, and, and the things that cannot be electrified are very, very little, in fact. And we are seeing the development of technologies for electrifying everything that come and that make progress every day, like compact uh, high temperature heat storage for industry, turning eight hours of PV into 24 hours of uh, heat at even 1500 degrees. We'll see that coming in the next few years. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident we'll electrify most of the things because it's always much more efficient. Uh, if you compare, for example, the, the heating needs of the buildings, if you have heat pumps with an apparent 300% efficiency and the hydrogen chains that delivers that transform electricity into heat with a global 50, 55% efficiency, there is a gap of one to six. And so there is no way we could privilege hydrogen over electric heat pumps for heating buildings, for example, not to mention the safety aspect. So I think it will be concentrated in a few domains indeed. And uh, with respect to uh, chemical feedstock and for, again, aviation fuels and uh, shipping fuels, I do believe they will be produced in areas with excellent resources uh, where they will be uh, really competitive and will be transported as such as finished or semi-finished products and not transported as hydrogen because it's very expensive to transport hydrogen over long distances, uh, whether it's pipelining or even worse on shipping and or trucks, it's a disaster. So it, they will be transported as ammonia, as methanol, as naphtha, as e-kerosene and, and nothing else. And the, the real trade of hydrogen will take the form of hydrogen rich fuels and feedstocks and that's i think is important to capture now back to your second question how do we incentivize this i think we have to start with procurement for uh, industries we have to have like the uh, buy clean california act that says that requested all the uh, public offices to uh, buy materials that have a relatively low level of um, uh, carbon and other related pollutants in, in the production. I, I also believe that the, uh, the brand names, the brand companies, they are willing to pay for that. Uh, it makes no sense to buy an electric car if all the steel is just gray steel. And at some time they will say, oh, my electric car on top of that is using only green steel and green cobalt and green lithium, etc." So we'll have to solve all these issues relating to all the minerals that will come into our um, uh, manufactured objects. And, and this will be the driving uh, force. It already is uh, when Merx, the uh, largest uh, container ship company, says we, we're going to go to, 2000, uh, to, to net zero emissions by 2050. And, and when you ask them, but who will pay? They say our clients. Our clients are already willing to pay because if people continue to to accept that there is some international labor division and some some work being done just uh, just in China for example uh, and and uh, uh, artifacts delivered to uh, the US or Europe uh, people will be more and more asking that they are sure that things have have been transported in good conditions that will be part of the package and for a pair of jeans or an iPhone it's nothing the additional cost there will be nothing and the big uh, the big um, uh, comp trading companies will be willing to pay to pay the additional cost for that. So there are a number of ways. Uh, probably for aviation, we'll need to have mandate, incorporation mandate, as we have for biofuel in, in the cars. We will have for sin fuels uh, in, in the aviation. And yes, there will be a cost. We'll start low. Uh, the cost will be high, but the, the percentage will be low. And as the percentage increases, the costs will decrease. So we'll we'll have a premium on the, on the flight ticket, which is not a bad thing because they are too cheap now and they develop too fast. And there is no way we can um, uh, catch up with that growth. Uh, it, it's absurd. So we have to promote energy efficiency we have to decarbonize the fuel and we have to make the uh, travel pay uh, the travelers have to pay the real cost at the uh, the polluter price principle of the uh, on which the oecd was based since uh, based its environmental policy since 1974 uh, and yes there will be an increase in the cost of the um, air travel so what Thanks for sharing your thoughts, Cedric. We could certainly dive into each of these issues raised and record a new podcast, right? Uh, but for now, given the time that we have, uh, I'd like to move on to Rachel again. 
Rachel, considering the ultimate goal of reaching net zero energy systems and the various processes and fuels possibly being used to produce hydrogen, each one being labeled as one color. So we have green, blue, gray, pink, turquoise, um, just to mention a few of them. One important point is how to balance that rainbow range to create scale for the hydrogen use in the energy sector. What are the benefits and trade-offs that you see of uh, using blue hydrogen from natural gas with carbon capture as a bridge to green hydrogen? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think the answer to this question depends a lot on uh, jurisdiction, on geography. So, so this panel, we have, uh, we have panelists from, from all over the world, uh, and it's, it's great to have this international discussion. Um, but I think I think we miss out if we if we if we focus on a global picture without without paying attention to the the resources that individual geographies or individual countries have uh, that, that bring bring to the table. Um, so I I sit in the U.S. obviously, uh, and and in this country we have cheap and abundant natural gas, um, and and where we have already a large hydrogen industry for the purpose of of serving. The, the refining industry and the chemical industry, as, as Cedric talked about earlier on in the conversation, um, it seems to me that, that you ought to start with the relatively low-hanging fruit of retrofitting some of the existing uh, steam methane reformation facilities with carbon capture technology. Um, at least in, in these instances, I think we need to to take a look at what makes the most sense economically and, and start from what we have and, and see how we can decarbonize it the quickest. Obviously, um, the equation, like I said, is going to vary by geography because different regions have, have different distributions of, of energy resources. Um, and and to uh, to Barbara's point earlier, you know, certain countries, especially let's, for example, Chile, where, where this uh, where this ministerial is going to be hosted next, is is has you know amazing abundant uh, renewables resources and 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 where that is the case obviously green hydrogen um, is the way to go right um, so you know I think in going back to to jurisdictions like my own that 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 have um, that have good natural gas resources I think you know you are going to see that that fossil fuel based production is able to scale up more quickly um, using existing technology that said I think that it's worth noting that not all blue hydrogen is created equal um, so so you know you were joking about the rainbow of of, of colors um, but you know I think uh, there is blue hydrogen comes in comes in different shapes and sizes even within within that one color right so um, I'm, I'm not an engineer but but my understanding is you can have for instance autothermal uh, reforming that you pair with CCF which which you're able to car capture more carbon than than if you use the traditional uh, steam methane reformation plus CCS for instance so in my view, what you're really after is low carbon intensity hydrogen. Um, so if you want to judge projects, you want to judge projects by their net overall emissions, not necessarily by, by what color they are. Uh, so I worry a little bit that bifurcating the world into blue versus green uh, can do more harm than, than good in the end. I think I think um, Barbara had a good point earlier when she mentioned certificates of origin. I, I think it's important to focus on the uh, the carbon intensity of the hydrogen, not necessarily sort of <laughs> the color, whether it's whether it's yellow or blue or green or turquoise. Um, in any event, though, I think if we are if we're going to push forward on on both blue hydrogen and, and the green hydrogen front, we do need to be very careful uh, to make sure our blue hydrogen projects are doing what they say they're doing, that is capturing the carbon and 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 sequestering it um, and 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 sequestering it permanently. Essentially. Um, speaking from from my vantage point here in, in the U.S., um, here our biggest policy driver for for deployment of, of decarbonization is, is via the tax code, and um, we basically we, we we provide tax credits for the projects that we want to incentivize, and we do have one for carbon capture. And, and one of the important elements, from my view, is in the regulations around that tax credit is um, is whether the carbon is sequestered and, and stays that way, and if it's if it leaks out, then you risk having your your tax credit recaptured by the government. So, so I think those details are very important to think through. Uh, it's easy to talk about uh, blue hydrogen, but it's important to think through, 
you know, whether whether it is actually as uh, as clean as as it is as it is said to be. Um, and then I guess the final point here that I would make is, you know, there's obviously a lot of talk about the question of whether hydrogen is really a, a lifeline for oil and gas companies, uh, and therefore we should whether we should push for for green hydrogen to the exclu- exclusion of other colors. Um, and from where I stand, you know, if, if oil and gas companies are joining the energy transition by producing clean hydrogen, that's great news. Um, I, and again, it's really just a question of getting the policy and the incentives right to ensure that this emerging hydrogen economy is in fact a clean hydrogen economy. Well, thanks for that. Actually, this topic about the colors of hydrogen can be a pretty controversial, right? Uh, particularly because of the geopolitics and the economics. And I, I have heard also, you, you know, just forget about the colors. What matters is the carbon content. Just put a price on carbon, and but then you need to track the carbon content of the hydrogen. And that is also a challenge, right? Well, for now, we are coming to the end of this episode. But before that, I'd like to ask each of you to share one positive thing about your country or the region you're based in that can make us optimistic about the clean energy transition. Rachel, can you start, please? Sure. So my answer is is pretty basic, but um, I'm excited by just how mainstream the concept of the energy transition has become in the U.S., Um, that decarbonized energy is really no longer considered alternative energy, at least by most people. Um, and I, I was just talking a moment ago about the uh, incumbent oil and gas companies. Um, with a few exceptions, I think nobody wants to be left out of this party. Uh, there are a lot of profits to be made, a lot of jobs to be created in the energy transition. And I really think that the tide has, has turned in the U.S. in mainstream politics and in industry and um, in recognition of that fact. Now, Cedric? Yeah, I'd like to pinpoint two things, if I may. One is that the uh, sales of electric vehicles has really started to to touch the people, not only the administrations or, you know, the, so it's, uh, it's I don't know, it's maybe about something like 10% in the last, last year. It's really starting. And the second thing is the uh, launch at last of the uh, real uh offshore wind industry in France, we have huge amounts of wind and of coastal, and we are very, very late compared to our uh, European neighbors. Um, we have an industry that is well capable of making the floating offshore a success, and we are now launching the first large uh, floating uh, offshore wind projects, and I think that's a good sign at last. Finally, Barbara, one positive thing that you would like to share with us Well, I've got three things. <laughs> I'll start national. I live in Germany. And as I said before, Germany really is a leader with the technology and the um, commitment and the enthusiasm and the money to develop um, cleaner solutions for its energy. Uh, regional, I'm in Europe and I and I agree with Cedric. There's exciting projects in France and other countries. But I think the most enthusiastic the thing I see is the collaboration. And as Rachel said, that it's become mainstream on the street to talk about energy transition and, and the collaboration between the European countries and its neighbors. And then, of course, because in IRENA, we represent 163 countries. Um, so on a global level, we see a lot of positive enthusiasm, as I mentioned before, and we will continue to increase dialogue Uh, facilitate more commitment and see a faster development and faster commitment by the governments to increase renewable energy. So I think it's a very positive story. Well, it was uh, great to, to have your positive prospects. Barbara, Cedric and Rachel, thank you so much for your time, for being available, for sharing your perspectives. It was a privilege talking to you today. Also, I'd like to thank the audience and invite you to check the 21st Century Power Partnership website at 21stcenturypower.org to find more about the work we do to move the world towards a clean energy future. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.